Nicole, not Nicole and Anna, thank you so much. And uh, we are going to have our last panel of the day uh, w uh, where we're going to have Victor Rubin, senior uh, fellow at PolicyLink, will be the moderator, uh, co-editor of the journal, and a true leader in this field from the very beginning, uh, a real intellectual of the first rank. So we're very excited to have him. Please have his uh, panel come up. We're going to have a, a, a case study of the Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. We're very lucky in New York to have this organization, the first community development corporation in the country and an organization that doesn't rest on its laurels reimagining itself through arts and culture. So, Victor, take it away. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you to the San Francisco Fed and the New York Fed and Art Place and all the people who have made this kind of work possible. I was delighted that our whole previous panel had all been contributors to this journal. So you get a feel for the breadth and range of perspectives that we're trying to bring together. Um, I think I am, by virtue of leading the research into the community development initiative, now responsible for what Rip called rigorous, or what Penelope called rigorous analysis of what Rip called the hard to measure but essential dark matter. Uh, I guess we specialize in that sort of thing at policy link. Not as many statistics as in most issues of the journal, right, Laura? But we are getting a rigorous evidence base in our own way. Um, it's really delightful to be here. I live and work in Oakland, California and have for decades, but I am a New York street kid and I went away to college and never came back here, but my uncle had a loft as an artist a few blocks from here in Tribeca before that was fashionable. And my mother was toiling away as a social worker for the city a couple blocks north of here. And I seem to recall when I went off to college, I said, you know, I'm going, but I'll be back in 50 years to talk about arts and community development in the neighborhood. <laughs> and here I am. And we are delighted to be joined by leaders of the Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation. Uh, when we began this work, as Liz Crane has said, the CDI uh, stories are all about community development leaders who are taking up arts and culture for the first time by virtue of the grant, as, as Jamie Gauthier said, and as the others' stories make it clear. They were leaders in health or in parks uh, uh, renewal or in housing or in economic development or youth development, but they were new to this kind of strategy. And we were looking in, in the spirit of uh, the hard to measure but essential. We weren't just tracking what they built and we weren't just tracking the projects they undertook, which were numerous, scores and scores of things. And uh, I just want to make this list because I don't want this day to go by without just recognizing just music of every possible kind by people from 8 to 80, so to speak. Poetry, original theater productions, storytelling of all kinds, photo voice, experimental film, Mimes in the streets, public art, interior design, landscape architecture and design, on and on and on, all of it community driven, all of it with artists who have moved from what we sometimes call social practice to what the Center for Performance and Civic Practice calls civic practice, a real authentic engagement with the community organizations. So we were looking not only to track what they did, but those themes that you've heard throughout the day. How did the organization change in order to make this work? What were the collaborations between artists and CD professionals actually like at the ground level? And could you learn from that and reproduce it? How do the arts and culture strategies add to new forms of community organizing and power building? And at heart, what's happening to the social fabric of this community as a result of this work? Are we building collective efficacy? Are we building a sense of shared identity? Are we giving voice to newcomers? So that's the kind of thing we've been trying to track as we watch these organizations take this on for the first time. But there's another way to learn from this, and that's to look at an organization that has had this work, this arts and culture in its DNA since the beginning. And that's what we're going to do today. The Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation is the nation's oldest community development corporation. If you don't ever never read about that history, I encourage you to look it up. There are all kinds of ways in which you can learn about going back to the days of Robert F. Kennedy and the other founders of the organization. 
So we're delighted to have three leaders of that organization to talk about a little about that history, a lot about how it works in the present day, and to project a little into the future with the neighborhood changing, with the organization always growing, what it might look like in the future. We're going to ask them to each uh, introduce themselves, as it were, for about two minutes each, and then we'll engage in a questions and discussion that will allow us to dig deeper into both the past and the present and a little bit of looking at the future from their different vantage points. Colvin Granham here is the president of the bed Restoration Corporation. Indira Atwaru is the executive director of the part known as Restoration Art and is also the director of the Billie Holiday Theater. How many of you here have been to the Billie Holiday Theater? Okay, pretty good. The little audience development work is, could still, but not bad, no? No, that's right, yeah, remember. And Hollis King over here is a graphic designer, which led him to be an entrepreneur in the music industry, and now he finds himself as creative director at Restoration Hot Art and Billy Holiday. So they've been there for different amounts of time. They have different levels of experience in history with the neighborhood and with the corporation. We're going to start by asking Colvin to give us a little of that origin story and your own perspective on it as you came into it and now are as a leader of it. Colvin? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I am, too, a uh, kid from Brooklyn. I dare not say that I was a street kid because my mom would probably come down from heaven and slap me upside the head. <laughs> She did a good job of keeping me off the streets. Um, I, too, uh, went away to college, and I came back um, in my early 30s to practice law, got very involved in a church that was very focused on building community, and out of that, I was born a whole new career for me. Um, when I got to Restoration, um, now it's about 19 years ago, um, it already had a very strong arts and culture program anchored around leaders, the people who were leading uh, the Billy Holiday Theater and um, what was then known as the Restoration Youth Arts Academy um, and the Skylight Gallery, were people who had dedicated themselves to ensuring that art and the art and culture of people of African descent was promoted and preserved in Bedford-Stuyvesant Central Brooklyn. And I want to take a step back and, and say a little bit about Brooklyn from my perspective of both someone who was raised there and someone who now has the you know, honor and the privilege to work there. Um, in Brooklyn, you know, everybody hears about Brooklyn now, and the t-shirts sell very quickly all over the world. Um, Brooklyn has always had, at least black Brooklyn, a very strong emphasis on culture, right? We've always had a community of people who were nationalists, pan-Africanists. Um, I grew up at a time when there was an arts center called the East that was very focused on promoting the Af arts and culture of people of African descent. So to an extent, it was very natural that when the founders of Restoration convened the community and said, what should we do, that not only would they talk about housing and education and business development, but they would also talk about art. And, and so, having it incorporated, not just because the residents wanted it, and that was a key factor, but because I think there was a recognition also among the founders that it is a pillar almost of every healthy community wherever you go, right? Whether it's Scarsdale or Santa Barbara, right? There's going to be a cultural center, and there's going to be activities for youth, and there are going to be festivals, and there are going to be all kinds of things that stimulate and engage people. And to an extent, it might have been outrageous to think about it as an anti-poverty program, but we were fortunate that we have visionary founders 
who understood. Um, so I, I was very fortunate. Um, my, I had a, I'll be quick and say, I had a couple of aha moments though when I got to restoration because we, when I got there, we, we were, resources were tight, let's put it that way. And, um, and there was some pressure from funders to like look at right sizing, like just do what you do, you do housing, you do commercial development, you, you know, what do you know about arts and culture, Colvin? I don't. I don't. Um, but I knew that it was important. So I went to a play in the Billy Holiday Theater, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. It, it, it was clearly a safe place that people were going to, they were laughing, they were relaxed, they were being renewed, and the experience was so palpable to me I was like, this, this is it, right? And then, you know, we've had a long history with Brooklyn Academy of Music, now known as BAM, around Dance Africa, where dance troops from all over the continent of Africa are brought to Brooklyn annually and paired with the youth in our program, and our youth learn the dances of that of that locat of that nationality, and typically it's even more finite than that. There's, you know, a tribe or some, you know, locality within a, uh, a nation there. And I watched the young people, um, our people, our young girls and, and young boys, learning the dances. And I don't know, it could have been Botswana, it could have been Zimbabwe. And I watched the interplay, and the, they were having aha moments, like, you can do that? Is that easy for you? And I was like, this is deep, right? Like, there is a real connection here that's building dignity, and it's um, building creativity, and it's building a whole bunch of things that we want to see in our youth. So that's how I got involved. Thank you. Indira, you're the steward of this work these days. How did you come to it? What was it when you first experienced it, and, and what has it meant to you so far? Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Victor. Um, I came to Restoration. I actually met Restoration and Colvin because my first foray into the nonprofit world was at BAM, coming from the academy. So I was leading education and humanities initiatives at BAM almost 20 years ago, actually, and I was running the Dance Africa partnership, and so I met Restoration. Um, and met the staff, and met the young people, and the parents, and the community. Um, so when I, I'm going to take a you know a sort of thirty thousand foot look, but when Restoration decided that they wanted to to bring together all of these different parts of a whole, the Skylight Gallery that. Colvin talked about the Billy Holiday Theater, the presenting program. These are all programs that were doing great work, and yet there was a vision at the table by both Colvin and the board. Um, and I have to say that one cannot take for granted that the person making these decisions should be a lover of arts. They should actually love arts, they should see arts, they should just think about arts as a part of the DNA of their life, and we have that. Um, and my partner and leader, Colvin Granham, he, I swear he sees more theater than I do. I'm, I'm trying to keep up, but um, that's a really important part of the fabric of these shifts that we're talking about. Um, and so when I came to Restoration, it was after a national search, and what was clear to me, there are three things that have stood out in this discussion so far this afternoon, the burning patience has stood out. This, uh, this notion that Penelope talked about of experimentation and rigor. And um, then having Nicole stand and perform arts. Often we have these conversations minus those things. We have these conversations minus the ethos of experimentation that artists, we try things out, we see what works, what sticks to the refrigerator, um, and that there is a burning patience, that often institutions do not move as quickly as artists do. 
And so for us to be able to think about that burning patience. Um, and then finally, um, understanding, you know, I often think of the work I did in public radio where I was brought in and I didn't know this for a while, but I was the first African-American executive producer in an almost 90 year, year, year history. And so there were a lot of learning curves there. There was a lot of how do you take an institution through change, launch a green space, a live events platform when they've been doing one platform for 90 years. So it feels like CDCs are having those exact same conversations, right? Um, so radio hosts would say, oh yeah, we've been doing live events for a long time. And I'd say, oh, a folding chair and a folding table and a microphone. Hmm, I think we could do a little bit more than that. And so I think we're at this incredible moment where we've been doing incredible arts and culture in Bed-Stuy, but by bringing all of the arts and culture together under one business model, which is something that the board and Colvin and I have been spearheading for the last five years, we're seeing extraordinary growth. So even within the mechanism of arts and culture being a part of the CDC, there's still lots of, uh, lots of tenets of experimentation that we're still going through. We're still in a trajectory of figuring things out. We're still in a trajectory of trying things out. We're still in a trajectory of feeling like, oh boy, we <laughs> thought we got that right, but our community is saying you can do a better job with that. So I think we're still in a really powerful phase after 52 years of doing this, of still learning a lot and reimagining what our 21st century audiences need from us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hollis, can you describe for us how you came to be involved with Restoration Art and with the corporation and how, how you see it from your perspective as a, both an artist and a business person in the arts? Yes. <coughs> uh, thank you for inviting us. I, um, I come from a world of designing and making art for musicians. So I've worked all over the world with artists internationally, making their art for television and for their CDs and their projects and so on. And I was in the middle of a transition and Indira was at the green space. She was working on, I think, their eyes were watching God. <clears throat> and I went to a show I usually carry a sketchbook and I sit in the audience and I draw. And she said to a former colleague of mine, get his number. <laughs> so she gets my number and I'm saying, okay. And she calls me and she says, we're doing this project and I need this poster. But here, who is in this thing? It's Ruby D. It's Alice Walker. It's everybody you read about in history. And I do this thing, and they liked it. <laughs> and she called me a few days later and says, we're having a lunch. Could you come and sign some posters? I got paid, so. <laughs> I get to this lunch. Alice Walker, Ruby D, Gloria Steinem, it was this room full of history, and here I was, and so our saga began. Following that, we did the August Wilson Century Cycle, recorded for NPR, and I got to read this box that came to my house of 10 plays by August Wilson, and create characters for the whole run of it, and they liked it. And then she said, Alice, we are going to plaster all the windows on Hudson with your poster. I'm like, mm. -hmm. And of course, they plastered all the windows, and it was this exciting time. Then I get the other call. I'm at Brooklyn at Restoration. And the thing you discover about Indira Etwaru, she's a force of nature. <laughs> and she agitates. Her, her washing machine is on agitate, shake the dirt off and get to it. And so 
one of the things that attracted me to working with Indira is that we are constantly shaking the dirt off. And my approach to doing this work at restoration, at the center of everything we do in this underserved community, I ask the question all the time, what does it mean to be human? In America, what does it mean for somebody who's underserved to be human? How do you restore someone's humanity through the arts? And so my, my approach is to walk the streets and talk to people. And I come back to Indira and I say, Indira, I read a Life magazine. And I read an article about the brown paper bag. Intraracial discrimination in America during the Second World War. I had no idea that this existed. So I sat with it and I got very upset about it. But every time I get upset, I create. So I went to Dollar Tree. You can buy 44 brown paper bags for a dollar. <laughs> I discovered that. And I started painting on these brown paper bags. And then I looked for writings by black writers and philosophers and Mexican writers and Native American writers. And I put these quotes under these brown paper bags. I drew on 70 brown paper bags. Every day I would draw on brown paper bags. I come to Indira and I'm thinking, this is crazy, right? Indira says, we're doing a play about color, colorism. I think it's a good time to do this exhibition. So we do the exhibition. And the other piece we do is always when we create, how do we engage the community? How does the community get to have a part in this performance, right? So we provided baskets of brown paper bags. 1,600 residents wrote on brown paper bags. And some of these writings will tear your heart out. We're talking about 2018. One young lady says, I was staying with some friends in New England, so I bathed in bleach to lighten my skin to be more accepted. Another counselor tells us a story of a young lady on the top of a building in bed threatening to jump because her boyfriend said she was too dark. So, 1,600 different stories from the community because of this idea that was a little quirky and a little different. So what I learned from that is walk around and listen to the people. Let them tell their stories. Let me put skin and bones in the discipline that I have to make things that engage and help restore their humanity. Because we say, when you do art for underserved communities, that is excellent, that tells their story, you help to restore their humanity. And what it means to be human to me is far different than being born and just being a human being. What it means to me is to be more caring, more loving, more kind, more empathetic to people who are not like you. I think at the center of everything I try to approach is, is it excellent? And is it going to help someone's humanity? Is it gonna help restore someone's soul? So at the core of everything, I am trying to be more human. And I do it through the art. Thank you. Let's talk a little about the people you're engaging and about the community, about Bedford Stuyvesant and about Central Brooklyn. I'll ask each of you to share a few things about how that community is changing, what it's like now. It could be as basic as who lives there and the diversity of cultures that 
may not have always been there or may not always be understood to be that community? And any observations about how your work might be changing as the community changes? And then we heard earlier from Jamie about how issues of the perception of gentrification and displacement is an issue in all kinds of neighborhoods, whether the new housing is going up right away or whether it hasn't come yet, but you can see it over the horizon. So just give us a little more sense of the community because that's obviously gonna be a key point for whatever cultural strategies you undertake in the present time. Colvin, would you wanna go first? Uh, um, Beth Stuyvesant is a community that has and is undergoing massive change. Um, demographically, um, it's a community where the African American or uh, Afro American Caribbean population has dropped from over 90% to, in some census tracts, under 50%. Um, and it's a community where I think the middle class is being hollowed out, where there's a growing affluence and still large pockets of concentrated poverty. Uh, there are growing numbers of businesses of all variety. Uh, there's a lot of vitality and vibrancy, a lot of creativity, a lot of economic diversity and racial diversity. So in many ways, there are lots of things to be optimistic about. Um, as Jamie said earlier, the job that we have now is to connect all aspects of the community to the growing wealth. Our new strategic plan calls for us to disrupt and close the racial wealth gap. We think that net worth is the best measure of overall well-being, whether it's educational attainment, housing stability, employment stability, health, and mental health. The two things, net worth, especially liquidity, assets and liquidity are highly correlated with overall well-being. So what we're trying to do is connect people to asset building opportunities, employment opportunities, et cetera. Um, we have, you know, I haven't talked much about Restoration Plaza, which is one of our principal assets. It's 300,000 square feet of prime real estate in the heart of central Brooklyn. It's a mixed use facility. It has everything from a supermarket to a theater and a gallery and dance space. We have almost 20,000 square feet of space dedicated to arts and culture. That's one of the things I did. I expanded the arts and culture footprint I, when I got there. We have restaurants, we have offices for nonprofits and for-profits, and we have an institution of higher education. It's a, we have lots of public space where people put on job fairs, health fairs, performances, all kinds of things. It's a very vibrant facility. Um, so, it serves as sort of a town center, and, and what we see in the use of the facility and even in the use of our programs is just greater diversity. Um, people of all races and ages are coming to either shop, bank, we have three, three banks, um, dine, or participate in the programs of other organizations. What my vision for restoration really is that we are in this country accustomed to, I'm gonna just be very pointed about this, white-led organizations that welcome everyone. And, but still might have a point of view that's sort of Western and maybe Eurocentric. I think it's equally plausible that you can have an African-American-led institution that has an orientation that's around preserving and building the culture and the peoples of African descent, but is welcoming and inclusive for everyone, right? Like we can share, we can recognize differences. And so um, that's what we're trying to do. I believe that's what we're trying to do, at least that's where I'm pushing us, that we, we continue to uplift and promote the people of African descent because they're worth it, just regardless of whether they're underserved or not, but also the fact that they're, I hate these words, 
but the fact that they have been historically disadvantaged is another reason to have the focus. But while at the same time, being able to welcome everybody and share the assets, right? Because, because the people that we serve and the people who have lived in Bedford Stuyvesant over the last 60 years, I mean, Bedford Stuyvesant has gone through change for the last century or so, have lots of talent, lots of creativity, lots of entrepreneurship. And we really want to be a place that cultivates that so it can be shared with the borough and the region, et cetera. So that's sort of my point of view on that. Indira, um, what do you see in the people that you work with and the audiences and the, pe the people who are engaged with the arts? What's the community look like to you now? What strikes you as particularly relevant for a discussion of how arts and culture more broadly than arts can play out in the next few years? What we're very cognizant about is that um, not only has our community, our audience, mainly been comprised of people of African descent, um, but that we do have, as Colvin mentioned, uh, a pocket of poverty in Bed-Stuy. 33% of our community remains under the poverty line, 48% for the ages of 18 and under. That informs, in a very strategic way, how we craft our arts and culture presenting programs and how we craft the, this notion of accessibility. So everything from ensuring that more than 50% of our events are free and 100% of our events are at a very discounted rate compared to subsidized rate compared to um, other markets and other theaters, even in Brooklyn. Um, when we think about accessibility, we think about how does that apply to a youth arts academy. We want to ensure that if, if central Brooklyn, which it is, and the Bronx are cultural deserts in New York City, and there aren't arts programs in our school, how do we ensure that young people after school or on the weekends can still experience art? And so our Youth Arts Academy, we ensure that tuition is kept at a very, very accessible rate. Um, we work with philanthropic um, entities to ensure that they can help subsidize that, um, as well as our ticketing. And therein lies the rub, actually, of creating these accessibility uh, platforms for the last 52 years, but not always having the subsidies that support those um, access points. Um, I do want to acknowledge that uh, the New York Community Trust and Jerome L. Green Foundation just launched an access program that actually for the first time uh, created a support of the subsidies that we've put in place on behalf of our audience. Um, those are the kinds of philanthropic sort of radical ideas, radical, not radical, however one wants to um, categorize that. It makes a big difference when a community development corporation has been on the front lines of, the kind of, of that kind of accessibility program for 52 years, but because it's a part of our ethos, because it's the part of how we do business, our culture, it isn't always acknowledged as a need, but it is incredibly um, important that we can maintain that accessibility. We're very cognizant that, you know, the NEA study from 2015 debunked this theory that black folks and people of color do not attend or culturally participate because of ticket pricing. One of the reasons they don't is locale, that they have to travel so far out of their neighborhood to experience arts and culture. So for us, it's not just about accessibility in terms of ticket prices. It's ensuring that we have a 24-7 hub of different types of artistic experiences that different community members, whether it's a parent looking for an experience, a millennial, a baby boomer, whatever the the uh, demographic is that they have a place in which they can experience arts and culture. We do shift, we do see shifts happening. Gentrification is a, it's a long, slow journey. It's not something that just started 10 years ago. It's been a very long, decades long journey in Bed-Stuy. Um, and we have always, arts and culture has always had the point of view that we're focused on the stories of people of African descent, but all people are welcomed. 
Um, we did put a stake in the ground and create a new Windows Festival this year. Um, pretty radical in the black theater art space because we programmed our first playwright of non-African descent and Hollis curated um, the first visual artist of non-African descent um, in our 4752 year history. Um, I think a pretty extraordinary experiment for us. Lots of new audiences came through our doors that we've not had before, um, intrigued funders in an interesting way, press that we'd not had before. So it opened up the CDC model and the arts model um, to new conversations that we've not had. So again, that's a part of our ethos of continuing to experiment. Thank you. Hollis, what, what do you hear when you walk the streets as you described it? What, what, what are the different cultures of Bed-Stuy and Central Brooklyn these days in a way that might not have been? Are there immigrant voices and immigrant communities yeah, in, so in, among people of African descent that changes the nature of what arts and culture means from what black nationalists might have thought 50 years ago when they set it up? You know, what, what's it like these days? So I, uh, I'm an immigrant, I should say that. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, and I grew up in Brooklyn. So West Indians always had a home in Brooklyn and the West Indian Day Parade. But there's a different type of immigrant you see now from West Africa, um, European speaking French and German and stuff I in bed -Stuy. And so when I talk to people with a diverse community like this, the programming I do in music, for example, once a month we showcase new talent. And people are from Nigeria, people are from everywhere that come to perform. We pay them a small stipend and we try to reflect the community's diversity. And as Indira pointed out, we have uh, the new Windows Festival. So we have an amazing artist from Bulgaria. Her name is Luba Lakova. And I remember someone confronting me in the lobby and said to me, so what's this now? The restoration has changed? Uh, what's going on? I said, well, 95% of the artists we present are of African or West African descent of the community. And when you find people with a shared humanity, that you do that as well. And what we found out from this exhi exhibition called Designing Justice is that when the work reflects some of the difficulty these people are having with justice, and it's so clear that the God at the door is arguing with another God, which is their favorite piece, and then fashion designers are arguing about pieces it connects with everybody. And we learned the valuable lesson, one, that this artist who is at the Museum of Modern Arts Permanent Collection and is showing in bed -Stuy, adds a stamp of approval for other artists to be part of it. And so for us, we learned the lesson in terms of how we select people who are coming in and to make sure that what they are doing is in alignment with the issues that face the community. Um. Indira made a reference to um, where, we're, where we're headed and where we've been and specifically um, I would say that in some ways until we found Indira I saw my job as preserving the assets we had right so and oftentimes these were totally uneconomic decisions. It was just that we had something special. We had one of the oldest black operated and founded theaters in the country. Same with the art gallery. I mean, we had like real genuine assets that had histor historical significance. What we didn't have was the kind of leadership that could implement the vision to have arts be a vehicle for community change, um, for even creating a new aesthetic 
uh, opening up new conversations. I mean, that takes a special kind of leadership. And we did do a national search, and we were very fortunate to have Indira. One of the things I have to say, though, is that we have Indira because of some fa the faith of some funders and foundations who believed what I and my board believe. Like, if we can find the right person, that these assets can take on even greater significance than they've had historically. And we have, over the last four or five years since Indira's arrival, and let me tell you, what she arrived to was a mess. It really was. I mean, you talk about silos. Yes, everybody, the, art, the dance people protected what they did. The theater people protected what they did. You know, it was what you would imagine. And, and these people were great and deeply invested and had their own constituencies that were very powerful, right? Like there were some people who were perfectly fine with what the Billy Holly Theater was doing. They didn't see a need for change. They didn't see a need to bring in younger audiences or, new, or anything, right? And so her entry, as much as it was great for me, because I saw it as moving towards a vision, it was very disruptive, right? And it was hard on her. Um, but I just want to make that point that we're at a place where we are beginning to experiment. We're at a place where we're beginning, where we're saying like we can begin to explore and test and go beyond um, the discipline silos, which serve their purpose. And I'm not, because I'm not criticizing that, but there's just such, so much more potential. Yeah, and, and if I can jump in here, um, I think it's really important because since we're the case study, I want to make sure that CDCs, those who are thinking about this work, Understand it feels like I mean to me it sounds like a it can it can sound like a love fest But there's a strategic Partnering that has to take place there has to be Arts and culture and the way I might have done things at BAM is not the way it's going to work It's not a plug-and-play at restoration Colvin has to be able to think about partnering and having different conversations than he's had we're bringing in someone who comes from the music and creative visual arts industry. I purposely did not bring in someone to curate visual arts who has been a curator at another nonprofit institution. That was quite intentional because we needed to ask different questions of ourselves. So the love fest you're hearing is really, you know, four and a half, five years of us taking a really hard look at what the arts and culture assets were, where the CDC model was, trying to find middle ground. We have our moments, Colvin and I. We um, do. We do. <laughs> we do. And um, this is not a result of it, my arm, but... <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking, Colvin. I'm joking, Colvin. Um, but no, we have our moments, and, and it's the good kind of, you know, difficult dialogues with dignity that if you're going to do this work, be prepared to have, because that's how you get to the good stuff. That's how we've gotten to the new stuff. Yeah, I so think. I, I uh, you know, I'll give you an example. <laughs> Maybe we can actually oh, recreate no. it. Um, so I told you our strategic direction is to disrupt and close the racial wealth gap. So there's a whole bunch of themes that can come under that. Home ownership. Um, there's themes around gentrification. And so I'll go and I'll look for a play. And, and, and then and Daryl will say, Colvin, do you have to be so literal about it? And I, but that's all I know. But my point is that I can't, as much as I want to push um, her approach to our strategic direction, and I have, you know, I'm deeply committed to what our arts people do, but I'm also deeply committed to having it complement our strategic direction as an organization, right? So those are the kinds of, when I get into the how she should do it, um, that's when we typically have our uh, tussles. One of our, one of our, uh, that's great. I, I, I'm inclined to just let you keep going back and forth and it, as you say, it's not entirely a love fest. It's a, it's a self-assessment of what five hard years have been. But for a 52-year-old, then 47-year-old organization to have that spirit of experimentation is a wonderful thing in itself. 
Some of the CDI organizations are venerable. They're 30, 40, 50 years old themselves. And, uh, and they used, in the last few years, the arts and culture opportunity to take a very hard look at themselves. To, and the, the busting of silos and the getting back to first principles and values, cultural values, like Alaska Native village values should be informing the Cook Inland Housing Authority. The voices of the Micronesians and Latinx people in rural Minnesota should be informing the work of the Southwest Minnesota Housing Project in a way that it never had before. And you know, the identity of Little Tokyo and Los Angeles should be celebrated, preserved, and fought for in the current sense. This caused the organizations to have to rethink, well, can we actually do that the way we're organized? So I think what you're describing is actually an openness to organizational restructuring and rethinking that we're starting to see where and wherever the CD organizations take the arts and culture opportunity seriously. As much as it's the performances and the artwork and the engagement strategies, it's what happens inside, which has turned out to be very important. Yeah, so thank you for that, yeah. And, and, and to that point, Victor, um, there's some wonderful ways to get to understand what the audience thinks or what's, you know, what's a, a pressing topic for them. You could survey them, but Hollis's Brown Paper Bag Project was a really important survey for us. What were the through lines that kept appearing over and over again, which helps us think about future curation and future projects and ideas. Um, another project that we've done is 50 and 50 writing ourselves into existence um, with a curatorial statement that Dominique Morisot crafts. And we, we sent it out as a community um, project uh, expecting women from Brooklyn and New York City to respond, black women, to share stories. We ended up getting stories from across the globe, which is becoming for us a very legitimate community. Those stories are starting to have through lines. Women are starting to say some of the same things over and over, which informs some of our future curation. It's no longer the artistic director in the ivory tower deciding what everyone should experience in terms of art, but really allowing the community to help lead some of those conversations. Thank you. If I have this right, in our prep call, our conversation, Hollis referred to the arts as a doorway through which people pass to become involved in other aspects of restoration. Is that a fair, fair statement? Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? And, it, and I'll tell you where I'm going with it after, before you start. I want to come back to this question of arts or cultural strategies as a tool for organizing. Because even an, ex, an engaged audience and um, residents who contribute in all the ways you described is still several steps short of collective mobilization for the goals that you might have as an organization or as a, as a community. But let's start with what it means to be a doorway in and then maybe we can talk a little more about other ways in which people become engaged. So yeah, I did say that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Art is a doorway to enter restoration and to all the other programs and services that they have. Mm -hmm. So whether it's music or it's a play, if it's good, there's something that resonates with people. And they would ask us, what else goes on here? I, I came here for the first time. Well, this has been here 50 years, but someone who is I don't know, 18 years old or 22 years old. They don't know anything about the history of restoration. All they know is they're coming to see this performer, they're coming to see a friend and so on, and they get engaged. So it takes them to maybe summer programs, getting a job, employment. It takes them to help, getting help with their taxes when taxes comes around. It takes them to the dance programs or registering their children for dance. And so it all connects. So it means mm -hmm. that when you come to a dance or something like that, there should be pamphlets and a little bit of literature that ties in the rest of the programming and so on. So, so, that, so you, that's kind of how yeah. I meant it. I'll ask any of you, have you used that or in any other way engaged people beyond 
that ways in which you've described either as recipients of services or contributors to the collective story. You have an ambitious policy agenda about disrupting and closing the racial wealth gap, and you spoke about the s significant structural poverty that still is endemic in the neighborhood. And there are many other areas in which collective advocacy would be important. Do you get engaged in that, or is that other, is that the domain of other organizations? And can the arts or the cultural strategies be a way to engage, either if you're doing it or other groups whose work you appreciate are doing it in bed -Stuy? I think one of the things that we've talked about, Colvin and I, is um, um, we have been approaching policy from our leadership places, so sort of one-offs in terms of being a part of cohorts that create funds or being a part of you know, um, a conversation or working with council members to sort of rethink policy. But one of the uh, visions that Colvin has talked about, which I think is incredibly exciting, is really expanding the policy arm of restoration, Bedford-Stuyvesant restoration. I think he'll talk best about that. But even given the limited um, sort of resources around that, because that is, um, that is an area that must be resourced, both human resources and other resources. Um, we have an incredibly smart executive team made up of uh, Tracy Capers, who runs our Economic Solution, Solutions Center, and Gordon Bell, who runs our Weatherization and Small Businesses, and Dernest um, Sinkler, who runs the Restoration Plaza, and everyone, as well as Colvin, um, everyone is always working in their respective fields to ensure that we're a part of policy panels, we're a part of the sort of moving and shaking that's happening, and that's led us to Colvin's vision, knowing that um, a policy arm, in order to go into the mitigation of the racial wealth gap, really does um, start working against dismantling some of the systems that have led to the inequities that we're um, actually challenging. Yeah, I think I would answer that question. Um, I would build on Endura's answer. Um, <laughs> in two ways. I could talk about it in more than two ways, but the two ways I will talk about it is um, under leadership, um, we've had some plays that really do speak to equity issues. Um, we've had plays that have been very provocative. On all those occasions, uh, we have talkbacks um, where, you know, people they almost have the sense and feel of a town hall where people are um, discussing their experience, what they're gonna do next, et cetera. Um, your question goes more to, do we organize social movements around arts and culture? And, and this is something that um, I would say, not explicitly, I don't know, am I doing something wrong? Might be my battery, okay. What should I do? Switch? All right. So the second thing that we, the second prong to my response to that question is, and this is an overlooked part of what bed -Stuy Restoration has done for 52 years, is that we nurture organizations and movements. Like we don't always provide the infrastructure for something that's happening, but we will often provide the space and other supportive efforts. And one of the things about restoration and, and this is that there are so many different organizations, political, um, cultural, I mean, I can't name all the different categories, that use the space for organizing, for learning, for training and to the extent that they need support, whether it's media coverage or c flyers or whatever, we see it as part of our job uh, to support that. So I would say in a, in a very sort of explicit structural fashion, fashion we, I can't say that we use arts and culture to uh, propel social movements, but I think we use all of the facilities we have 
to nurture a spirit in the community that launches those kinds of efforts. Thank you. I had to ask it. I'm from PolicyLink. I wouldn't have been. And, and I want to just <laughs> add to what Colvin said. In the 1990s, 87 percent of black theaters that were founded in the 1960s and 70s had to close their doors. 87 percent. So the, the mere fact that the Billie Holiday Theater is still surviving is not in large part to, it is wholly in, in, in debt to the partnership that was created by the founding partner restoration. It would not have been able to sustain itself minus that partnership, which leads me to the radical idea of sharing assets. When CDCs are thinking about building arts programs, there are arts programs that exist that need the support or could use a partnership like a CDC so you don't have to think about building from the ground up. Um, but radical partnerships are actually, I think, an incredible way to think about the CDC and arts and culture models coming together. Great. Our battery's starting to run down, our time is running short, and in the four minutes we have left, I want to give you each one chance to offer guidance, advice, suggestions, and I'll suggest several audiences. You can pick whichever one you like. One would be artists themselves, artists who are serious about building up their civic practice. What is important for them to know about how to build a good working relationship with a community development organization such as your own? Another might be the investors that we talked about earlier. Um, we have everyone from bankers to philanthropy to social investment to many other types of possible support for this work. Is there anything you want to add to what you've heard today about what to tell investors? And then the third would be your peers in community development agencies. Anything, any last thoughts for any or all of you, just a minute or two each on any of those audiences? Yeah, I'll talk about the investment piece real quickly because um, I wear different hats that relate to that. And I think that those investors, CDFIs and others, who have had success are those who, two things at least, one, are willing to customize what they do, given the actual operating model of the cultural organization or the related entities, right? So, you know, we've had investment from a, a range of banks and CDFIs, et cetera, the ones that actually work or the ones where they're not trying to do something off the shelf, where they really are trying to um, structure it to fit our operating model. And it could be any, anything from working capital to new markets, new markets tax credits for facility development, et cetera. The second thing is it's helpful uh, to push a cultural organization to think holistically about what it takes, not just to build um, a cultural facility, but to operate it, right? And then, you know, to layer on this whole thing about uh, impacting the community in broader ways related to equity, et cetera, that takes even different kinds of capacities, right? So I would say um, this, the impact from my perspective as somebody who's been doing this work for more than two decades is that I don't know I honestly don't know whether restoration would still be here if it didn't have a large arts and culture component. And the reason I say that is because I don't know that people would have thought that we were relevant. I mean, we had some hard times, really, really difficult times. And I think the only thing that kept people with us is that they saw themselves in restoration. And the last thing I'll say about it is that we're getting ready to take on an extraordinary project that I call the mother of all community development projects. When we finish it, we should be at about 700,000 square feet of mixed use space. Um, and uh, we've run um, a series of focus groups already. And the one thing that we heard most stridently from folks was that we needed to preserve and expand the arts and culture component. And in a sense, as a, in a community that's changing, they see restoration as a potential bulwark against cultural gentrification, right? Uh, so those are the points I would make. 
Any last points? Just one minute each, if you'd like. Advice for any, any of these sectors, your peers or others? Um, as, as the CDC model and arts and culture models continue to innovate, I would encourage um, those who are the philanthropic, the funding world, to continue to be creative and innovate. Um, I do want to give a nod to the Kresge Foundation because they have uh, awarded restoration and the Billy Holiday um, a grant that's going to allow us to actually think about this with intentionality. We've not had a moment to sort of not drive the car and change the tire at the same time. And this is giving us a moment to really think strategically with great intentionality. So I would encourage while the conversations are innovating, there needs to be resources where those models are innovating in alignment with those. Thank you. Thank you. Last word? I think artists who are working in this space should come in here and not bring everything to the community from up here. I think you need to be here to listen and to execute with your expertise, but also be in service to and not layer on top of. I wish you the best next 52 years and thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. Thank you.